Okay. So, let's only one. one that was a little bit challenging at first, but you actually did work through it yourself to figure it out. Number six, I just kind of found, uh, I mean, it's not really that difficult. It's just that I, I kind of forgot how exponents work and when it's appropriate to multiply or add them. Okay, and so you put a little, or you do a little research and figure it out. But I decided that you have to multiply them with that one. So it'd be like, uh, 
U to the 10, and then like V to the negative four, but then that would just go under afterwards. Okay, you did that, and then what'd you have down here? A arrow, oh gosh, I'd have to do. Yeah. Oh, see, we're, like I would have to put those ones under because they're being put to the negative <laughs> ones, and they would be the ones that go on top, so it'd be kind of like a reciprocal, I guess, because they're okay. to that. Uh, negative power. Okay, what about this two? What do we do with that two? The two. It, it becomes. Uh, you put it down here? Yeah. Oh, okay, so you so got to it at once. It'd be two to the second, but I put that below, okay, so yeah. it would be. And you put that it'd eight be four, basically. Squared up here. Yeah. And you put the. And then the W squared that uh, would have to go on top too okay, so because it goes to the once. negative. Yeah, and then you put the V to the negative, uh -huh. fourth to the bottom. Okay, so I'm going to go into 64. Uh, U. 10 to get a negative there, so they're going to write that one if they're going to write Please it here. Please interruption. Can we have juniors Four. A through J? Please go to the gym foyer to have your picture taken. Juniors A through J. Please go to the gym foyer. Thank you. Okay, so you might be a little rusty out here, but the, the expectation would be that you are good at this. You're very good at Exponents, adding, subtracting, multiplying, exponents. I'll be okay. right back. All right. If you have trouble with it, you should not be thinking so much, uh, how do I do it? But, uh, I, you know, there's some kind of vague notion in my mind I'm supposed to either add these exponents or multiply these exponents. Uh, I need a little refresher, okay? So, if you want to know that, you should really uh, think, what are exponents telling me to do? Just a quick refresher. If we have a w squared to the fourth, and you're wondering if that's w to the eighth or w to the sixth, you don't know if you're supposed to multiply or add. First of all, that so shouldn't be the question, should I multiply or add? It should be really the question of what should the exponent be, which means how many w's am I multiplying together? Right? So what does this mean? Right, that means mul multiply this thing by itself four times. That thing that you are multiplying four times is w squared. Each of those w squareds is two factors of w, w times w. So all together, you're multiplying how many w's all in a row? You create four groups of two w's, a total of eight w's that you're multiplying together. Don't ask yourself, should I multiply these exponents? Ask yourself, how many w's am I supposed to multiply together? And therefore, what is the x? Contrast w squared times w to the fourth. Well, should I multiply or add the exponents? Again, it's a silly, wrong question. How many w's get multiplied together? This is just w times w times w times, if you're just multiplying with w's, how many w's? Six. Yeah. Okay. I think if you can remind yourself of those two things, if, it, if you, like, your brain's a little cloudy and you need to just remind yourself of that, it can get you through you know, most of the issues. Um, let's come back over here. What's another one that is was hard, but you put some work into it and you, you go through and you figure it out? Mm -hmm. uh, 17. 17. I was confused at first by the top part, and then I realized that it's a, like the squares. Squares? Yeah. For the, for the subtraction, yeah. so it's a difference. Difference of squares, yeah? You guys remember that? Difference of squares? Okay. What'd you do? Uh, so I I, uh, I rewrote it out as 4x squared plus 0x minus 1, so uh, I didn't see it all. Okay, so you just see it as a normal uh, trinomial, normal quadratic. Mm -hmm. And then I factored it into 2x plus 1 and 2x minus 1. And then the bottom factored it as well into 2x minus 1 and x plus 3. <laughs> and x plus 3 you said, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> and then uh, the 2x minus 1s can cancel out. Hopefully this is not going to be a big struggle throughout this year. I'm going to remind you right now, 
of why it is I can cancel this 2x minus 1 with this 2x minus 1. Why can I do that? There are factors, right? <clears throat> that, that's key. When you say factor, I mean, it's, it's, it's a big word. It's got a lot of meaning behind it. A factor is something that's multiplied by something else, right? And when I say common factors, I mean the numerator has a common factor with the denominator. So by contrast, x plus, let's say x squared plus 2x plus 3 over 2x minus 1. Canceling out a 2x like that. It's tempting, because they look identical. It makes the kittens cry. It makes the kittens cry, right? You're canceling things out when they're not common factors. Okay, so the reason why we can't cancel this out is because this is very simple, is they're just not common factors, which means 2x is not something that I can multiply by something else and get this numerator, okay? We're all fairly advanced here, so I can show you how we could write it that way, but then we get a bigger mess, right? I could write it as 2x, then I have to multiply it by something. I mean, I have to distribute it into some other thing in order for it to qualify as a factor. So to, to multiply it by something to get this, I would have to multiply it by um, 1 half x, right? 2x times 1 half x gives me 1x squared. Okay, then this is great. This could be 1 if I can do this. There. Uh, that's a 1. And to get a uh, 3, after I've multiplied by 2x, I would have to have a, what would that have to be to get 3? When I distribute this 2x. 3 divided by 2x. So I get this fraction thing that when I multiply by 2x, I cancel out the denominator of 2x. All right, this is not simpler, in case you're wondering. Not good. Okay. And down here, if I wanted to do the same thing, I'd have 2x times 1 minus 1 over 2x. Now I can certainly cancel out a 2x because there are two factors of 2x. But now what's left is a big, messier mess. So just remember that. If you make that mistake, I will help you remember, but you know, we, we don't, we're not going to spend a lot of time teaching that kind of stuff. Okay? Uh, how about another? Let's do one more, and then we'll, work, we'll, we'll go into the ones that we're just like, I'm still stuck. Still don't know. Okay? What do you say? What's another one that you're proud of? It was hard. I have a hard time with 12. Well, but you made it through. Right. Okay. What did you, so if you're trying to get P, it's all wrapped up in two different terms, and it seems it's hard to get to. Um, so I have P out of RT. So you see we have a P factor here and a P factor here, factor it out of P. Right. So P, if I took out the factor, that means I wrote it as P times something. P times what? RT. Just RT right here? Uh, one RT. Sorry, one plus RT. Oh, one plus RT. Okay, let me uh, back it. Sorry. No problem. I knew you were wrong. I was writing uh, purpose. <laughs> Teaching moment. Okay, no. Why is your pen moving? It's not the pen, it's the, this, is a, this isn't the smart board software, oh, it's gotcha. PDF software, so it kind of works differently. So we factored out a p. If we were to distribute that p into 1 plus rt, what do we get? p plus prt, right? Beautiful. Equals a. Okay. Oh my gosh, what the heck is going on? <laughs> a. Okay, then we want to get p by itself. We would do this the same way we would if it was 3p or 4p or 7p or anything. So something, is, this is basically the coefficient of p. Divide that coefficient out, and we wind up with a, little, a divided by 1 plus rt. OK. I'm going to take screenshots. These next ones bring them into the program. Okay. Let's pick a few, and then we'll come back and we'll actually work on them. What's one that you're still on? Okay, 
What's another one? 50 something? Oh, I said 54. 54, I heard. Yeah. Because you said it very clearly. Mr. Stewart? Yes? Can we get the equipment so we can run this experiment? Sure. The, um, you find the, the sensors in one of these boxes uh, right there. And. What the beach balls from elementary? Or what? Did you have the beach balls from like the elementary? I from. Um, Newest fifth grade teacher, what's his name? Oh, I that guy. The basketball coach question mark? No, he's no, the, oh, Tucker? Tucker. Tucker, yeah, yeah. that's him. And let's yeah, make sure. Good. Think about it. We'll do those three right now. Okay. Voltage V in electric current or circuit is held constant to current I is inversely proportional to the resistance R. If current is 120 milliamps, then when the resistance is 5 ohms, by the current, when the resistance is 15 ohms. Okay. So most of the Fusion is, uh, well, there's lots of words. And this, this unlocks it, though. This is the thing that unlocks the whole deal, all right? So if I say one thing is directly proportional to something else, that means something specific. If I say it's inversely proportional to something else, that means also something very specific, okay? So let's talk about the things that are inversely proportional to one of the, the voltage is, um, Inversely proportional to the resistance. Okay, that's a very simple thing. It's just a, a, a word way of saying something. Maybe we write in an equation that would be that the voltage is equal to some constant, usually called K, over whatever the thing it's inversely proportional to. Okay, now let's think about that. Why? Why would we call that inversely proportional? So this is inversely proportional to that make sense of why those words got used. Inverse is proportional. Can all high school K through Z 
go down and take your pictures. Thank you. Okay, it's so, all right. This is directly proportional. This would be when one gets bigger, the other gets bigger. One gets smaller, the other gets smaller. Here's the inverse relationship. Okay. So, what do you think? Just by writing that, does, does that help? Let's take a look. I think it all will be pretty natural. In fact, I'm not even sure if that I comes into it. Uh, voltage V in electric circuit is held constant. Oh, if the voltage V in an electric current is held constant, the current I is inversely proportional. So we, we use the wrong letter here. Okay. Sorry about that. I meant juniors are supposed there to come in and take their pictures. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so let's read on. They've told us this inversely proportional thing. If current, okay, what represents current? Why is it I? I don't know. I learned about this in a college physics class. It doesn't make a lot of sense. I is current, but it is. I is current, and the current is 120 milliamps. So 120 goes on the left side there. Uh, when resistance is 5 ohms. What can we now know? K. We can now know K. Multiply both sides by 5, and k is equal to 600. So now we have this formula, let's call it. We can take 600, divide it by whatever the resistance is at any time, and we get the current. Uh, or we can know the current and find the resistance. So what is the current when the resistance is 15 ohms? sense because what is it saying about V? It's being held constant. Like there's nothing going on with V, it's not changing. So when you I don't know anything about electricity, but whatever voltage is, when you hold it steady, then this relationship is true. Okay, does that help? Is that you think that was all you needed to know? Okay, in terms of log x, log y, and log z. Alright. So, you can see just by the multiple choice uh, options, there's, a ho it's hopefully jogging in your memory, there's these properties of logarithms that allow us to rewrite a logarithmic expression in other ways, right. properties, okay? So, here they are. The log of a product. First of all, can you remind me what a logarithm is? It's basically another way to do exponents. Yeah, it's kind of like that. It's it's really the like the exact opposite of exponents, but it's like right there yeah. in that wheelhouse. So just a quick reminder: uh, if two to the third is eight, how can I, in another way, using logarithm, express that? Uh, is it log base three to the two? That's right. Or no, eight, log base. Two. Two, eight. This is the thing that needs to get raised to an exponent. This is what you get when you yeah. raise it to that exponent. This is the exponent, right? Okay. Uh, I don't know if there's anything like QT rhyme that helps us get there or whatever, but there it is, okay? Logarithms are the inverse of exponents. There are also lots of other things, right? They tie into math in other ways as well, but they do have this relationship with exponents. That's what we care the most about. Okay. So, just really quickly, if I did log base two of eight times four, I've conveniently chosen two powers of two to display that this relationship is true. This is just log base two of eight plus log base two of 
4. Just break it up like that. And here's why, because really a logarithm is an exponent. What happens when we multiply numbers together? We add to their exponents. You see the relationship there? Uh, really quickly, if I want log base 2 of 8 times 4, I'm going to multiply 8 times 4. That's going to take those powers of, of 2. It's going to make some, some bigger number, right? I took two powers of 2 and multiplied them together to get some bigger power of 2. Right? What I'm asking is, what exponent would I need to use on 2 to get this whatever 8 times 4 is? Well, I would need the power that it takes to get 8 and the power it would take to get 4. I would just add those powers together. That's what this is saying. What's the power that it takes to go from 2 to 8? What's the power it takes for 2 to get to 4? Well, this one's 3. This one's 2, 5. If we were multiply these together, we get 32. Log base 2 of 32 would be 5 because 2 is the next 32. So in general, the log of any base of a product is uh, the log of A plus the log of B. Whatever exponent it takes to take the base to A plus whatever exponent it takes to take the base to B log of A over B, log of A minus the log of B. Okay, so when we divide, we subtract exponents. And the log of A to some power, you guys remember that one? Oh, uh, yeah. The exponent, so that one would be N log A. Yeah, N times log what are we doing? We're taking A, that is some power of this base, even if it's a funky power, it's a power, even if it's 1.726. Some exponent will take the base to this number, and we take that to some other exponent, we take an exponent to an exponent, we multiply it times. So there's those properties. If we can see this problem uh, as some expression that can have these, these uh, properties worked on it, then we're good to go. So, what's the first thing you see, the first property you could use? Gotcha. Uh, division. Yeah, we got this big quotient. Okay, so if we use quotient, then what are we taking minus what else? Log y uh, times square root z plus the log of x squared. Which would basically be 2x. Or no, 2 log x. And I wrote but so after plus and I said minus, and so I said minus because we got that there. And then you're jumping to the next step, which is basically we're going to apply this property and pull that 2 down in front. So this could be minus 2 log x. How about this guy? Can we do something with these? The, uh, the addition, right? We got a, a product here. We can break it apart as log of y plus log of the square root of z. That's great. That's good. What about this? What are you going to do about that guy? Any other chance? Jumping all over it. It's, it's z to the one half. You got it. <coughs> and how does that help explain? You can take one half and put it in front of the log z. There. Log y. Two log x, that should be x. And now we see what are we going to B? Oh, nothing. We're oh. trying to figure it out still. Okay. Whoa, you changed your animation. I did, yeah. Trying to spice it up. Got to the full list, no? <laughs> okay. So the temperature in degrees Fahrenheit uh, over 12 hour period is given by the function blah, 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 where little t equals zero denotes 6 a.m. So little t is a time. And when, the, when is the morning temperature? 47.5 degrees. So if little t is time, what's big T? You think? Temperature. Temperature. Here's something that's crucial that will start to go over like first. Should, I'm sure you understand it. I mean, whether it looks like t of t or f of x, or anything of anything, let's talk about that. What does that mean? Y function of both. Y, yes, this. 
all of it, this, all of that, you can think of it as why. What's why? It's the outcome. The outcome. Or the output. The results or the answer, whatever you think of. Okay? So that's the output. Now what else? I mean, for there to be an output, there would have to be an input. So Do some the factory thing. The factory if thing. You drew a factory in uh, algebra two and I right. did the input output thing. Yeah. Not on But that is that is my favorite analogy. I kinda I don't know, I don't know if it goes over as well, but yeah, we had a two-three factories, and we had two factories, we had all sorts of different <laughs> factories. Uh, you put something in for x, and something comes out. Okay, so don't get confused about this notation. It doesn't mean f times x. And uh, what you need to remember mostly is particularly this. It says uh, the morning temperature is 47.5 degrees. Okay? So the temperature is 47.5 degrees. This whole thing is the temperature. If there's a number value, it takes the place of all of that, right? The only reason why we write so much stuff here is the temperature, which is really that the output, is made by, informed by, is a function of the time. If I want to know the temperature, in this case I need to know the time. We could have some other function where temperature is a function of altitude or temperature is a function of uh, distance from the or from something like it can be a function of anything. In this case, it happens to be if I know the time, I can know the temperature. So for so um, like the variable that's in the parentheses is that the just that's not the constant basically like especially with like line graphs. What do you mean the constant? Well, it like uh, all the other th all the other numbers, they remain constant except for that one. So that's the variable. Yeah. That is uh, that you want to plug a value in yeah. for to get the out. Okay. Yeah. So that if you see that T of T, you should expect to see most often. Uh, it would be weird to see like T of T minus something else. That, I mean, it's you could do it, but it'd be weird. T of T should be equal to some stuff with T in it. A bunch of t variables. Do you have a different calculator we can use? Is it giving you problems? Yeah, I don't know. Okay. Uh, there we go. So let's go back through this this problem and, and look at it. So it says, when is the morning 47.5 degrees? I mean, I don't like to simplify math down to this level, but you have an equation, you have variables, numbers or what the variables are standing in the place of, you know that there should be some place where you plug in a number for a variable, right? So 47.5, where does it belong in this equation? The big T. The big T, it is the big T. Now does that mean I write something like 47.5 little t equals negative 0.5 uh, t squared plus 6 t. Now this is a common mistake. What is the mistake? There's no little t. Why? I mean, uh, big T is temperature. I should only replace temperature, right? Well, t just shows let's change the variable. Yeah, there's like, there's math happening over here. There, there's multiplication in there. There's uh, exponents, there's addition. Over here, there's not really any math. It's purely just representation. This is the temperature. This does represent the temperature. It's just giving you a little more information saying if I want to know temperature, then I need some, I need a time. So if you hold the temperature, that's what this is. This is the temperature. Yeah. Okay. So this is right except for, let's get rid of that thing here. That's, that's not necessary. It's a little bit redundant and confusing. So 47.5 is equal to all of this stuff. Now where do we go? Subtract 30. Subtract 30, OK? So that's going to give us or make equal to 0. Equals negative 0.5 t squared. No, what did you do? Make, um, take the 17.5 yes. and put it back on the other side. Yeah. So oh, now we're subtracting. We could have done this in one step. Negative yeah. okay. <laughs> uh, 0.5 t squared plus 6t minus 17.5. Okay, so now it's just a quadratic. 
Hopefully that's good news. Mm-hmm. To you. So like, when I say that's a quadratic, you say, oh, great. That, that solves all my problems. Um, so what do we do about it? How do we solve this uh, quadratic? Or you can make it, yeah, like the X. You can, or you can do the X. See or you, how about if we do this? Whenever I see decimals and fractions in the equation, I ask myself, could I like multiply by something and nullify these fractions and these decimals? Like, what if I multiply both sides by 10? Multiply by 10 on both sides? That could work. Because that's going to move these decimals over one, and now I'm going to have whole numbers. Let's come over here. Negative 5 t squared uh, plus 60t minus 175 equals zero. Because if I multiply by 10 on the other side, I get zero still. Now, all these numbers are divisible by 5. Isn't that nice? Because then I can be rid of this. And then I don't want a negative, so I'm going to divide by negative 5. t squared minus 12t. That's how we started this whole thing. So if we plug it in, I mean, that's good for checking our answer. We should get 47.5. What do we do? Um, I mean, how do we, how do we answer this question? T equals 0 is 6 o'clock, right? So add so many hours on a 6. If I add 5 hours on a 6, what do we get? If I add 7 hours, what do I get? Okay. How do I know which answer? Well, the multiple choice makes it kind of obvious. But also, what about this wording? Morning, right? So I have a morning time and I have a not morning time. I have an afternoon time. So 11. That's pretty late morning, but I guess it still qualifies. There we go. 6.7. Okay. Um, are these ones where I have like this as far as we made it to like 54 ish? What's that? That's six. So what I was hoping to. Did you make it to all the way to the end? Definitely. Did you find any other hard ones? The ones you couldn't figure out? No, I'm just sure if any of them are hard. Let's, well, let's figure it out. Okay. Let's, uh, let's try to get three more that everybody agrees is a difficult one, and then we'll work more individually and I'll try to do one on one, one basis. I think we did 54. Alright, let's grab a 53. Okay, what's another one that we could all agree is? 73. 73, everybody take a look at 73, you agree? It's pretty far, so it's surprising. Seventy 
72. Everybody agree on 72? Okay. Is this helping you guys? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Helping you feel more confident about the year to come? Yes. What? Uh, what could make you more confident about the year to come? Yes. Going back to algebra two. Okay, so within reason. You can see that cut there. Seventy-three. Oh, I think I did the clip so I don't know. Okay, let's try that again. So this kind of goes back to that basic uh, 2 to the third is 8, so log base 2 of 8 is 3, right? That's all they're saying there. All right. It's really a simple rewriting of the information in log form rather than exponential form. So if 3 to the negative 2 is equal to 1 9th, before I even look here, if I'm going to write it in logarithmic form, what's the base of the log? 3. And what am I trying to get? 1 over 9. 1 over 9. Let's take a look. Uh, log base 3 1 over 9. Yes, OK. What is the exponent I use? It's good. Let's look at this guy. Uh, 1 half to the negative 2 is 4. OK, so what is the base of the log? 1 half is also the base of the exponent. Four about that. Uh, log base 4 of 1 half is negative 2. Mm, seems like no. OK? I think it's that one. Yeah, yeah probably, probably that one. Let's even test it out. Let's see what 4 to the negative 2 gives us. Does it give us 1 half? 4 to the negative 2. What is 4 to the negative 2? 1 over 8. 1 over 4 squared. 1 over 16. 16. Careful of 4 squared and 2 times 4. So there it is. B is not true. Let's just look at these other ones. Yeah, for just to back to the more. 10 to the third is 1,000. So log base 10. Uh, well, what about this word? What is the base? 10. 10, right? You don't see a log, or you see, don't see a base. It's assumed to be 10, it's a common log. All right, so uh, log base 10, that's what that means. Uh, 1,000 should take me an exponent of 3. That works. e squared equals x. Well, then the base of the log should be e. That's our special notation for a log that has base of e. We try to get x, there it is, x, and then we take an exponent of 2 and make it happen. There we go. That's true, that's down the hall. So. Can I have j through z sophomore so down to take the picture? Thank you. Let's go ahead to this problem. back to this one because really kind of skipped a step uh, in writing. I didn't skip it logically, but I skipped it in the writing. How do we get from t minus 7 times t minus 5 equals 0 to t is either 7 or 5? Like this? Yeah. All right, now that seemed like kind of a, 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 a jump. I, mean, I have one equation, now I'm the two equations. How do you know that because this is true, then this would have to be So if either, either one of those is equal to zero, then the equation will always be zero. OK, it's going to be a little bit nitpicky. If either one of those is zero, then you know it works. We're saying not only is something times zero zero, but we're saying that this has to be zero. You see the difference in what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how do I know this has to be zero? Well, because it's equal to zero, because I am multiplying them together, and the only way multiply together and get zero is to multiply by zero. Not only is anything times zero equal to zero, the only way to multiply and get zero is to multiply by zero. Do you see the difference between 
That one is a little bit stronger. The only way to get zero by multiplying is with zero. So this must be equal to zero, and this must be equal to zero. Let's see if that informs this problem. Does it help us with the first step at least with this problem? factors, it needs to be set equal to zero because it's the only way it can work. That's two sine theta minus theta zero, also cosine theta plus two. Okay, that's, that hasn't solved all our problems, but it certainly got us started. What are we solving for? The angle theta. The theta, the angle theta, right? Well, the first step would be to get anything that has theta in it on one side by itself and everything on the other side, right? Probably a good place to start. So let's do what? Let's do, I would like to add, I mean, we could divide by two, but then we get fractions to work with. So we do that, and we get sine theta equals three halves. Now what? Very good. Not divide by sign, right? It's nonsensical. It doesn't make any sense. But if you take the inverse sign, for the purpose of this problem, it works well enough to say the sign and inverse sign cancel each other out, just like 3x. Well, 3x, you cancel out the 3 by dividing by 3. Multiply by 3, divide by 3, cancel each other. Inverse sign and sign cancel each other. So you take the inverse sign of this side as well. That theta equal to whatever the inverse sine of 3 halves is. Okay, let's just write that. Okay, now cosine of theta equals negative 2. What do you think of that? Cosine of some angle is negative two. Does that? Why? Not? Smallest you can get negative one. If your unit circles are very handy. If I want to think about sines, I'm thinking about the vertical here. So they go around uh, the, the unit circle. The biggest sign I'll get is here. Any angle that's coterminal with this, with this guy right here, we get a sine of one. We get a sine of negative one down here. Or, I'm sorry, cosine. Not cosine. We get a cosine of negative one, cosine of one. There's no way to get a cosine of negative two. So, this equation has no solution. Okay. So, our only hope is to find some theta that we can plug in here and get this to come out to zero. Right. So, it would be this guy that's the inverse of uh, the inverse sine of three halves. Uh, the problem is what? Three halves is greater than one or two. Greater than same problem. Bigger than one. I guess we can get sine is one. This is bigger than one. Also, no solutions. No solutions. Oh, this stuff? Oh, that. Well, that would come if we had gotten any answers out of this. Yeah, really. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, the punctuation in, in math is no, it can get kind of confusing. But that comma means, you know, this is some more information. You can't figure out what that information is. But for anybody that doesn't remember, if if we got some kind of an answer out of these, we just need to make sure that answer is somewhere between zero and pi. Yeah, really we think about it. When we think about sine and cosine, there's an infinite number of angles that have the same sine or the same cosine. So we do that forever, listing all those answers. They're very kind, and they tell us just list the answers between zero and pi. Okay. The whole set of to solve this guy.
would you say if we could get it down to be cosine of theta equals something? It'd be better, right? Can we work on that? Can we work that? Can you distribute that by 4 cosine theta is 5 cosine theta plus 1. What did I tell? Plus 5, thank you. Let's think about what four cosine theta is. So cosine theta is a some thing, some number, right? And all that number is is four times bigger than that. So altogether, this is some number. So yes, this whole number can be subtracted uh, away from the side, and we can be subtracted. And there we are, where we said it would be 58. Inverse cosine of one is theta. They're saying somewhere between zero and 360. So all the answers are the solutions to this equation that lie between zero and 360. So where will we find a cosine of one? Right, that's what this is asking. Find me an angle that has a cosine of one. Zero degrees. Okay. Uh, should we also include 360? I see 360 up there. Well, then why is it up there? Less than, it says less than 360. Ah, so not equal to doesn't include 360. Just less than 360. So just zero. Just okay. We say to. that. Uh, raise your hand if you got a question. Come around and see you. Mm -hmm.